Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on the Conscious Resistance uh, Network and Conscious Resist Resistance YouTube channel. So today we have uh, Richard Heathen coming in from Canada, who is uh, the founder of the Liberty, Liberty Machine News uh, website. He's a filmmaker, activist, and he's uh, producing a... Uh, a series called The Hidden Influence, and the first one was released recently, uh, The Rise of Collectivism. So, uh, Richard, so tell us, uh, when we start, tell us a little bit about how you, um, you know, got into liberty and how you became an anarchist. Well, you know, first of all, I don't like the term anarchist because I don't think it, I, I, because it has so many uh, connotations with the far left, you know, the, the real anarchists, the traditional anarch anarchists are leftists. I prefer to refer to myself as an anar either an anarcho-capitalist or libertarian, usually, usually a libertarian, but also I sometimes like the, to wear the mantle anti-statist. Uh, anti um, but how I became involved with liberty was, you know, I've kind of, uh, through my childhood, I had, my parents had some unconventional friends, and I was exposed to other viewpoints, other, you know, I guess what some people might call conspiratorial ideas. And so that, that those ideas kind of helped shape who I am. And then after 9-11, I kind of seen that, well, something was happening, right? We were, seeing, we, were, we were witnessing a ramp up of authoritarianism in Western society. And so that kind of was the start of my path. And then after, fast forward a uh, years later, Ron Paul's 2008 campaign is what really solidified the idea of liberty for me. It basically, because I was grow growing up in Canada, we pretty much are bombarded with a left of center viewpoint. There are certain viewpoints in Canada which are basically default. Um, pretty much it, it, anyone who hasn't thought about or questioned the status quo, quo is going to be basically center left. You know, They're going to believe in things like socialized medicine that that is a good thing like you know in canada socialized medicine is almost like a holy grail they look at the american or any sort of privatized idea of medicine as something horrible because oh my god you might have to pay for your own medicine when you're sick <laughs> there's no understanding of economics there's no understanding of basically how the system works and why it is flawed anyway so yeah, you fast. Ron Paul helped me kind of shed my status tendencies, my left of center tendencies, and then I kind of went deeper down the rabbit hole. Discovered Murray Rothbard, and then um, I decided that I needed to do something. So, which is why I created LibertyMachineNews.com, and uh, you know, Alex Jones actually played a a, a fairly strong influence in helping shame my shape my ideas it's interesting the reason i made the film hidden influence was i was listening to him one day and he basically challenged his viewers like oh you want to be alex jones you want to be alex jones well save us money and make a movie you could be basically i'm like well i'm like all right yeah i can do that sure and so basically that's what i've been doing ever since if, if i'm wondering if alex jones didn't issue that challenge to his listeners if i would have been making this film Wow, <clears throat> very nice. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good influence from Alex. Yeah, I also was uh, into Alex Jones for a while. Um, I went through my. I I, I um, basically ascribe him to the uh, the the doom porn, <laughs> you know, sector of the uh, activism. It's like you know he's good, but then again, you know he just sounds so um, you know bark like he's his barking voice, and he's like sounds pessimistic and all about you know the collapse and you know here are your survival supplies and you have to buy them from me <laughs> well you know to be to be fair though alex jones is a probably a better capitalist than nine out of ten anarcho-capitalists yeah, very, very true you know he's <laughs> he's true. able to create a, a a product which has been successful and meets market demand uh, do i agree with everything he says no i of course i don't but you know i also think that there's a it's really hip to be again to be hate on alex jones and to poo poo him well, I'm sorry, but Alex Jones has created probably more anarcho-capitalists than and more brought more people to liberty than any of the other names out there. So, well, yeah, I don't agree with everything he says. I think you know he's kind of. I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't want to work for him. But <laughs> I, I think the idea that this trendiness that is 
uh, festers in the liberty movement about, oh, we got we got to like poo poo Alex Jones because he makes us all look bad. No, Alex Jones, if he makes anyone look bad, he makes himself look bad. I, I don't. I, there's another thing that I'm annoyed with is this collectivism. Oh, the, we have to we have to kind of disassociate ourselves from people who say things we don't agree with because, oh no, it'll make us look bad, look bad, look bad. Like, mm-hmm. here's the deal: the the people, the statists out there, they they already don't like us for for our ideas. It doesn't matter who we're affiliated with. I think I think there's a a panic in the liberty movement about wanting to look extra credible to the people we actually don't like, and I I, I don't understand it. Yeah, no, no, I uh, I get you. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, without Alex Jones, I don't know how long it would have taken for me. Um, and you know, it's funny you mentioned Ron Paul. You know, I I wasn't that influenced by him, although it's really amazing how a politician can turn so many people into into <laughs> you know anarchists and volunteerists that is fascinating to me <laughs> and i think recently there was a video of ron paul where he basically he uh you know publicly supported you know the idea of volunteerism right which 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 is awesome <laughs> um, yeah i've seen that he said to be an anarchist is a great thing basically yeah, yeah. and you know it's again i have the my issues with the term anarchist but uh you know i think he's completely right i think he's a complete He's obviously a volunteerist or at, at heart, you know. He just has to – his shtick as a politician, he had to say certain things, certain keywords. But he, I think I think his always – his – Ron Paul's uh, – what his goal was was always outreach. I think he was always trying to speak truth to power. And I think what inspired me about him was seeing him in the House of Representatives, basically calling them – calling everyone – all of the politicians out there on their bullshit. I loved it. I think he was, uh, you know, I, I think we need someone like that up here in Canada. I'm kind of trying to work to get that to happen. But yeah, I think that's what brought me to Liberty was seeing him kind of truthfully speak tr- speak to the, you know, corrupt hordes of Congress and call them all out to their face. And I, it was that was a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, at the same time, you know, I I kind of uh, shudder to think that if um, if somebody like Ron Paul or even like Adam Kokesh, who said he's going to run for president, um, uh, when is it, twenty sixteen or something? Um, yeah, no, twenty 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 twenty. I think that was it. Twenty twenty. He, he was going to run on the Kokesh was saying he wants to run on the platform of dissolving the federal government, which I think is great. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is it is great. But then I, I think you know if he actually did get elected, I would fear for his life because it's just a massive leviathan, and I don't know to think that somebody can just go in there and then just you know nonchalantly just dissolve each one of the agencies, and <laughs> I don't think that. That would be so readily accepted by those people, you know, working those agencies or the people in Congress. Of course not. You know, but the thing is, what what do you, what's the alternative? Are we going to go? I don't think agorism is going to save anything. I think, you know, you actually think that ignoring the that you just going away and ignoring the government, they're just going to leave you alone, really? Yeah, yeah, that's that's it, yeah, it's true. There's you know, there's one sector of the population of the you know volunteers population that's more into the you know the black markets, the gray markets, and agorism and you know trading. And, and, and that's, I think, uh, you know, from my, from my perspective, like I have, my, my website is Peaceful Anarchism, right? So, so I'm always addressing, you know, the peaceful, you know, non-cooperation, non, um, you know, uh, non-association with the federal government. And, you know, if you look at the government as a leech, as a parasite that, that must, you know, um, siphon off the productivity of the industrious, when, when we do in, in large numbers withdraw our our funding and support and participation in the parasitical government then seems to me that over time that will weaken it. Um, well, but yeah. you might weaken it to a point. But think of it this way: if you do that, see, and all these people start being agorists, and it it gets to the point where the government isn't making enough money, and, or it's hitting their hitting them in the wallet. You don't think they're going to ramp up efforts to go after people who are avoiding them? Sure, that they'll go over the people who are the probably the best targets, uh, people who make the most money and, and such. But I think that it'll just basically because if you've still got statists in power, they're still going to use the state for what for what it is, and that's a hammer. They're still going to try and bang as many heads as they can, and it might work. I don't think it would because I like I said, I think if they see you as a threat, they're going to come after you. They're going to they've they've got the most. The U.S. government is the most heavily armed government in the history of 
man that I know of anyway that uh, and you don't think they're going to use that force against people they'll, they'll call you terrorists they'll call you this they'll call you that that's why I think unless you're like planning a, an armed insurrection against the state you need people in there so they at very least won't turn their guns on you mm-hmm. yeah and, and I and I think that um, the most important people that we can reach um, you know in terms of the philosophy is the police officers and the and these the soldiers right the, mil- the military the order followers those are the people that um, you know without them they provide the teeth and the force behind the mandates and edicts right and so basically they you know they are the power so without them they're they're powerless and well it's interesting i've seen a um i had a book called the logic of life i can't remember what i i can't remember for the life of me what i did with it but it talked about in it the only successful revolutions are the, like i think they're talking violent revolutions but i think the rule can still be applied are ones that have the military or some sort of military backing and so yeah i think you're right i think if you're actually serious about bringing down the state i think you know in our lifetime i think you're going to have to get some sort of a few, at least a few top brass in the military because it seems to me and i'm not a, i've never worked in the military so i don't know i could be talking out my ass here but it seems to me that they basically the, the soldiers will follow the orders of the guys they respect, right? So if you got a guy on top, like a general or someone who you can, you can convince with our ideas, that would be the way to turn the soldiers against, get the soldiers to, stop, to not fire on people, right? So th- that's what I think. Yeah, I think you need at least, if, you're, if your goal is to bring down the, the state, you need to have at least at some level military support. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think all of these methods are useful, right? You know, so you have the agorist, you have the the person who actively tries to, you know, talk to and educate the police and the military, and then you have the people that actually try to infiltrate, you know, the government itself. Though, you know, all all the people are approaching it from different angles. And I and, agree with you, you and know? I think that uh, I think that you know I've had that uh, that point of view for a while now, but my problem is these kind of armchair and caps who are like, oh my God, you're interacting with the state. You, you, you're legitimizing it. I, I just, I don't have much patience for that because most of them, I don't think agorism alone is the answer. So I, I think that, like you said, we need, I think liberty is a war that, sh- that needs to be fought on numerous fronts. And the political arena, as frustrating as it can be, I think is somewhat necessary because the political arena is where people go to listen to ideas. Like, you and I can have a blog or podcast, and it's hard to get a lot of viewers. The fact of the matter is, but when you have a when you have a politician who is espouse, who's a good speaker who can espouse the principles of liberty, they they're going to get more attention just because that's where people that's where the that's where the spotlight is. That's where the, that's that's the platform. So to me, political action isn't so much about winning as much. Although I think it would be. I do think it's necessary to have a few people in, but in order for that to even happen, you have to have a platform, an audience. So first and foremost, I think the political arena is somewhere you can go, is somewhere we need to go to get ears if we're going to win hearts and minds. Yeah. Yeah, 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 quite right. And uh, yeah, I know there are a lot of people that are, you know, rail against um, people that do interact with the state, but it's true. It's just it's just a different strategy. It's not my preferred, you know, I that's not what I'm cut out for, but uh, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, right? So, um so so why don't we talk about your your documentary, um, you know, how that came about and and what it's about. Well, my film Hidden Influence, the first one being well, first of all, Hidden Influence is a film series, the first chapter installment be- being The Rise of Collectivism. Now, in The Rise of Collectivism, I document how the power elite through the, their tax-exempt foundations have helped fund collectivist and authoritarian ideologies. Uh, to, numerate, like, uh, for instance, in their tax-exempt foundations, like the Rockefeller Foundation, they funded numerous initiatives in education to promote socialism, right? Uh, I've got quotes from socialists in the United States, or excuse me, from the UK, who were looking at initiatives that were put forth by organizations like the Progressive Education Association and 
the National Education Association and how they were funded by the Carnegie Corporation and how they were basically, basically the guy says, uh, I think Harold Lasky says it's a program for socialist America and it was put, it was funded by the Carnegie Corporation. It was also, I think it was who organized it. Like I said, I'm pretty sure it was the National Education Association, which itself gets fun, got funding from the Rockefeller Foundation funded Oh, the Rockefeller Foundation, General Education Board. So there's it's, it's a whole, there's a lot of connections and stuff, but basically the gist of it is the, the ruling class has been funding authoritarian collectivist ideologies through the education system. I met, fast forward today, I hit on the social justice activism or social justice activism in the, in the education system. They're teaching kids that they're, that their identity basically determines their lot in life, that social mobility, that personal agency doesn't exist, and that your life is predetermined by your identity, that is your gender, uh, your race, your sexual orientation, that kind of thing. So, you know, basically, m my point of view is that this, the rise of statism, the, st the rise of collectivism, was been funded and facilitated by the power elite through their tax exempt foundations. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So so you're starting basically setting the setting the ground and and explaining how how we came to be the way we are today. Is it to a certain extent? Yeah, a lot of it. You know, uh, like if you take the social and it's all like marxism and stuff well they also funded they also funded fascism but it's a false dichotomy to create up fa fascism versus communism and you have to buy into one of the sides but specifically what i talked about in the last uh, part of my film is cultural marxism cultural marxism was based on marx's the translation of marx's economic theory to the area of culture it's all uh if you look in the university, say that social justice degrees, and it's ridiculous. It's anti. It's anti white male propaganda, and I don't really, I don't know how to mince the words, but it's it's basically what it is. It's saying that that all of this, all the problems these people have, that all the problems in the world are caused by basically white people. That's the translation of Marx's economic theory to the area of culture, because basically they were the people who came up with this stuff, the, the Frankfurt School. They wanted to know why some why Marx's theories didn't come true. Basically, they thought they Marx said if there was ever a, a a mass war in Europe, that the ruling class would rise up and overthrow the bourgeoisie government, and there'd be a Marxist utopia. Well, that didn't happen, and they wanted to know why. So, after after studying, they basically come to the conclusion that it was because of ca the of Western civilization and the inherent cat corruption of capitalism and blinding the proletariat to their true class interests. So the whole goal of, of cultural Marxism is to destroy Western society and to foment a Marxist revolution. That's why I see the adoption of these ideas into the liberty movement as completely toxic. How are we going to, how is it going to help the 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 adoption of capitalism if you're you're bringing into it an ideology that was created to try and destroy capitalism you know i think what there's some nonsense the center for the stateless society some one of those guys they called uh, more uh, murray rothbard a revolutionary socialist no he wasn't murray rothbard was a capitalist he was he coined the term anarcho capitalism it, it's just a way for them to try and twist their ideas to try and bring about I don't know, they're, they don't see, I don't think they see reality clearly, and, at least, I think, because honestly, I think a lot of, the, most, I think I, pretty much everyone, except for the people funding this stuff at the very top, they're all true believers, right? But I, I think they're completely blinded by a twisted ideology, and I don't think it has a place in the liberty movement. So are those people, what you're referring to, uh, they call themselves the anarcho-communists? Well, no, there's, there's, there's left libertarians, there's, yeah, and comms, anarcho-communists, they're part of this. Th they, they, they totally buy into the cultural Marxist ideas too. But there's people on, supposedly on our side who are trying to 
bring left libertarians basically trying to bring these ideas into uh, libertarianism. So you know, oh, we need to we need to uh, be more sensitive or about these ideas so we can bring more people. And basically, they're they're trying to sell it as a way to bring more people into the movement as bring because apparently. I've heard that the liberty movement is predominantly a white male movement, and somehow that's bad. We need more diversity. <laughs> Got to legislate the diversity. <laughs> but yeah, so they bring in these ideas under the the cloak of saying, "Well, we need more diversity. We need to bring more people in." But I'm sorry, but when you these ideas are an antithesis to liberty, they're basically saying that number one. Whitey's bad. Everything in the world is white people's fault because we've got this magical privilege. And also, it, it allows for, put it this way, if you, if you take this ideology, because they believe that capitalism is inherently, uh, is inherently oppressive, uh, systemic, systemic corruption, or excuse me, systemic oppression is the term I hear the left use a lot. So if you believe that you know, Western society is inherently oppressive, then why wouldn't you why wouldn't you say that advocate the use of force against the people who are doing the oppressing if you know if if someone's being oppressed they sh why wouldn't they use force against their oppressor and you can say well it's it's just the um it's 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 the system it's not white people we'll say that we'll we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they're not completely racist and that they just think that it's systemic and that white people bl believe, or excuse me, that white people are benef beneficiaries of, of, uh, of white, of privilege by this, the system. Well, that in and of itself gives the justification for the marginalization of a group, of us as a group. And I'm sorry, I'm not willing to be the new marginalized group because, just because history. It's just, I'm not, I'm not cool with it. I don't want anyone else to be oppressed. I don't want me to be oppressed. So I think the whole idea is completely and utterly toxic. I think it's disempowering, and I don't think it has a place in a, a community of people who want liberty. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. I mean, uh, you see, uh, I mean, you see that all the time, like you know, in the State of the Union address. You know how they uh, they try to pit you know the rich against the poor, or the, you know the, the black against the white, or the you know the workers against the the employers, <laughs> you know, and uh, and in this way also the you know the the uh, illegal immigrants, you know, against the you know the, the citizens, <laughs> right? And uh, and it's pretty nasty um, how how that kind of continuous strife between the people can distract us from who's really doing the oppressing, <laughs> who's really passing the violent edicts and mandates. <laughs> Well, the thing about left libertarians is I suspect that there, there comes times when their libertarianism comes in conflict with their leftism or their, their cultural Marxism, their PC values. And I think if they had to choose between their libertarianism and their political correctness and their, their cultural Marxism, whatever term you want to use, their leftism, I think their, their leftism will win out over their libertarianism because they, they view the world, even though they, they say they believe in, in uh, Austrian economic theory, they view the world in a, in a very flawed way that just everything is oppression. Everything is, you know, the, certain groups are oppressed by other groups and that, yeah, th that, that needs to be changed. So their very ideology is based on another form of collectivism. And it's I'm I'm just really getting annoyed seeing this in the movement. Like really, like how many more times do I have to put up with the word? If I have to see the word privilege one more time today, I'm probably going to pull my hair out. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I read a, a um, there was a post about um, the minimum wage, and one person said, you know, I'm a you know I'm a volunteerist, and you know I don't think we should have a state. But while we do have a state, you know, we should have minimum wage. Because it helps, <laughs> it helps the poor. <laughs> well, it doesn't help the poor. It doesn't. It doesn't help the people who need it the most. Exactly. It, all it does is make it har harder. And it's so hard to explain this. Even to smart people I know, <laughs> it, I have a hard time explaining this. And people who aren't like, who pretty much have a head on their shoulders and who aren't into this whole race baiting crap. The the whole idea of minimum wage. It's like, think about it. If you've only got like a third of your profit, say, well, you bring in X amount of money a month. 
and you can only a third of it you've got to spend on wages, you're going to just not be able to, uh, if you have a high minimum wage, you're just not going to be able to employ that many people. And it's going to be the, hard for the people who don't have skills to get work, you know, it, to get some entry level job. It's, it's not rocket science. It's really, really basic economics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I remember Christopher Cantwell was talking about, um, how, you know, as a, as an um, entrepreneur, he he's basically making less than minimum wage, right? <laughs> he's paying himself less than minimum wage. Yeah. But if he has an em employee, that would be illegal. <laughs> he pay that. Yeah, he's like, so it's okay if I impress myself, right? But I can't do it to somebody else. That, that would be a, make me a criminal, right? <laughs> no, it's interesting. And it's interesting to see how um, this cultural Marxist agenda, this leftist agenda is implemented in society. Because I went to like... I've relo I, I live in Vancouver Island now, and I went to a – it was a talk put on by the Green Party, or at least no one – the leader of the Green Party was speaking, and there was a couple other people who were speaking. And they openly said to implement their agenda, they would have to go in – and basically, they openly talked about how they have to work through uh, through – numerous political parties through various uh any social movements they could basically get into they didn't use the word infiltrate but that's basically what they were talking about and then what else <sighs> infiltrate oh yeah and they also they also talked about infiltrating um religious groups and using the and gave them the specific bible quotes that they would have to that they could use to kind of bring them on board so basically, they're talking about, and you know, these people are leftists. They have nothing in common with, like, they have no nothing but disrespect for religious people. So, or specifically Christians. So it's really interesting to see them do that. You know, people can laugh and say, "Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist," blah blah blah. They openly talk about how they want to infiltrate other social movements to inject their agenda. You know, the environment, like. If you look up, if you look sustainability and social justice, you'll see that there's a whole uh, academic discipline about how to bring, talking about how to bring social justice into sustainable development. You know, this is, and these are people with, who are working at big universities here in Canada, UBC, UVic. There's, the thing is with the left, they, they actively do work through other social movements to implement their agenda. I think uh, uh, Saul Alinsky talked about it. He said, "Organize the organized. Go in there, bring them in, and you know, make friends. Use nonviolent communication. Make friends, and then implement their agenda. Implement your agenda." So this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is people working to implement an ideological agenda. It's really no different. Um, like, no different from what I'm trying to do by creating, you know, liberty in my lifetime but the only difference is they're a lot more organized and they're a lot more sneaky about it you know i'm pretty open we're pretty open libertarians are pretty open about our ideas these people are more sneaky they'll, they'll go and like oh yeah yeah we uh, you know what's we've got i'm your friend let's work together i believe work with you on this and then they work to change your mind on that that and the other and it works on on weak-minded people it this is how they've been able to get their agenda forward but it's interesting because they wouldn't have the ability to do this without the millions and millions of dollars they get from these tax-exempt foundations. Like, another one I mentioned in the film was uh, the Moody School of Communication. They, it was in the, it's in Texas. They, uh, they host feminist bloggers who talk about, uh, who use the terms, what was the term she used, for the flagrancy of, unchecked, of such unchecked capitalism. Well, the chick doesn't know what capitalism is. All she knows is how to make a, a edgy sounding blog that'll rile up her lefty base. But yeah, they they get they got uh, fifty million dollars from the Moody Foundation in Texas to create to update their their building and stuff. And uh, yeah, and the people who there's a whole social social justice um, like the, basically the department head or the 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 assistant professor of journalism is also a she's a I guess a feminist also works with the Social Justice Institute in the in the college. So, you know, they're working at the, these universities. They indoctrinate people into this ideology. These there's social in Canada. We, some schools have a social justice class 
Well, I interviewed a lady for my film who was in that social justice class. Yeah. And basically, they're ta- they, they, da- they take you in a room and they divide you. Like, hey, if you're one side, if you're white, one side, if you're not white. Oh, you white people, you're, you're privileged. You other people, you're not privileged. These people have, a, have a privilege over you. <laughs> Do that with uh, your gender, sexual orientation, anything. And they always try and tell, it's all about dividing and putting and labeling one group as privileged and one group is not privileged. And then that, that, and that's public school. And actually, last I heard, they were working to make the social justice class mandatory in, in the schools in British Columbia. But uh, yeah, and then they continued that in the education class. I remember there was one, there's one college, I think it was Gonzaga in the United States, one university where if you wanted an arts or science degree, you had to take a social justice class. It was mandatory uh, because it was made mandatory by the Dean of Arts. So this guy, this gal or guy, guy or gal, who whichever, has a specific agenda he's trying to indoctrinate kids in. So it, it's actually absolutely revolting. And I see it infesting every aspect of society, including the liberty movement. And it, it, honestly, it makes me sick. Yeah, wow. It's, that's really amazing. I didn't know about that in the universities. Um, yeah, you know, the first thing that... Uh, I think is helpful when, when we're debating with status is a, a basic clarification of terms <laughs> because if you don't have a proper definition, how can you progress from there, <laughs> right? Well, exactly. A lot of times they don't want to define their terms because they want to be all loosey-goosey so they can rope you in with uh, you know, nice-sounding rhetoric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's not just like, because the funny thing is a lot of these people call themselves anarchists. And that's why I try and steer, steer away from the term because they call themselves anarchists. We call themselves anarchists. It, it, make, it muddies the waters. You know, I think I, like I, myself, I, I pretty much stick to the term libertarian or anti-statist, although yes, or anarcho-capitalist. Uh, because like I said, I, I'm a firm believer that capitalism works. Free, laissez-faire capitalism works and is basically the only uh, driver of wealth and prosperity in our world. And these people, they're communists, they're collectivists. They don't believe in the right of the individual. They don't believe in self-ownership. They think that the community should have a, a, a say on how you, um, how you order your life, how you live your life. You know, they would never, it's interesting, try and get an ANCOM to, to coherently discuss how their, how their society would work, you know? Mm-hmm. It, they don't. All, all they say is, oh, the community will come together. They're all wavy gravy types who don't really have a clear answer for anything in my conversations with them. Yeah. I mean, I also like, I also, I like those terms, anarcho um, capitalist, um, and I also like voluntarist because not many people. Um, I've met leftists that call themselves voluntarists. Really? Are you yeah. serious? <laughs> I am. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I, I, that's why I like the term. Like I said, libertarian, and I'm fighting to keep it. They're trying to uh, take it. You know, they're trying to, because originally the original term libertarian did come from the left, but also, but we basically took it because they took our term liberal, so we took libertarian back from them. But I'm I'm really struggling to fight for the term libertarian and not let it be uh, co uh, co opted by the left again. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really uh, anarchist. I think is one that's lost. Honestly, it's. You can use it if you like, but I think personally, I think the term is lost to the enemy. Yeah, usually when I talk to people, um, you know, when I go to places like you know um, the, the grocery store, the bank, or wherever I am, you know, walking down the street or in the library, and I get into these conversations, I never mention the word anarchist, right? But I just talk about economics and I talk about you know the illegitimacy of government and and law and things like that, and. Uh, and people understand that, and you know, because once you once you call yourself an anarchist or something, they they might start immediately to get defensive, right? So you know, those labels can be counterproductive when you're speaking to you know just regular people on the street. That's kind of what I find. <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough, you know. But uh, as you know, some people they don't like the term labels because it you know, I don't understand that. You know, don't label me, man. Well, no, a label <laughs> means uh, the reason you label something is so you can categorize it and, have, and define it, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, fair enough, it might not be best to call you, to even use any na- names or labels when you're talking to certain people. But I think, you know, the idea that somehow labels aren't helpful, I, I really, I, I don't, I don't buy into that ki- type of thinking. 
So, so when you talk to people, like um, you know, when you're on the street and, and everything, what, how do you approach the subjects? Do, do you try to spark up a conversation on these things with people? Like they, uh, they, sometimes it depends on the situation. I, I've I've been at this a while now, so my my I guess uh, patience for the average person is somewhat is somewhat <laughs> thin these days. So. Well, honestly, I try to let my content do the talking for me. I think uh, you know that way I can put out a, a well planned out, uh, well thought out debate. And I don't know, like I said, I don't generally like. Honestly, I'm a pretty busy guy. I don't generally strike up too many conversations with people I don't know. I'm I'm like I'm busy. That's yeah. I don't generally talk to too many people. Just at the line of the bank or whatever. I got might make the odd. Uh, the odd discussion or conversation with someone, but it generally I find the average person doesn't have a long enough attention span to see out the conversation or they get just overly emotional because you're stepping on their sacred cows. So either way, it makes it hard to actually have the conversation and, and show them that these ideas are beneficial. So yeah. So, so given given the fact that you um, you know you're in politics and you're trying to spread <clears throat> these ideas through the you know the political arena, um, what are your uh, well, what are your views on voting? Vote vote if it if there's someone who represents your point of view. I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, the last time I voted was in two thousand eight <laughs> for for Obama. <laughs> that's the last time uh, basically the, the only reason I did vote for Obama was because my family is mostly composed of Democrats so <laughs> that was just the person I was going to vote for <laughs> you know uh, I didn't really care about politics at, uh, you know for most of my life but until recently you know I really uh, so as I started to understand him you know it seems to me that politics is something that you know for most people um, it's just too obtuse and confusing and dense for them to understand and so most people just like shrug it off like you know just let the experts deal with all the economy and the interest rates you know I don't I don't have time to worry about that stuff and so most people don't put in the time I think an effort to understand all these things um, except when you know you really are, are presented with a coherent way to understand it like as in through you know Austrian economic theory and uh, anarcho-capitalism anarcho -capitalism, then then it becomes you know clear and then you know you really as you know in my case anyway you know have more of a desire to want to become active you know do, do you find that as well yeah well i think mostly i think there's just going to be some people who just it just goes over their head and they're not interested there's a guy you know your next door neighbor whoever there's some guy that's just gonna be the guy mowing his lawn doing his thing regardless of uh you know, if it's a communist society, he'll still be there mowing his lawn, doing his thing. Or if it's a an narco capitalist society, he'll be still there mowing his lawn, doing his thing. I think generally, change is made by a dedicated minority. I don't think the general population. I don't even think they care that much unless they, uh, as long as they have a full belly and a roof over their heads. Oh yeah, oh yeah, quite right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely the um, um, and then the bread and circus too. You know, that's why we've got so many pretty distractions. You know. The internet, well, the internet's a good thing, but also can be just a time killer. And you got the move, you know, the entertainment industry. So I think as long as people are there, they're fed, they're clothed, they have a roof over their heads, and they're somewhat entertained, I think they're just happy. Yeah, exactly. I think I think I remember a uh, a statistic that if uh, if the inflation rate goes like above forty percent. Um, then that's usually when revolutions occur. <laughs> because I could see that. Uh, I, I, I heard a figure that's often quoted to me that uh, you need 10%. If Once 10% of a population accepts an unshakable idea, society changes. Well, uh, it, that being the case, that's, we need to be very careful about how we as libertarians, liberty-minded people, spread the message of liberty. I don't think, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think attaching ideologies that were created to destabilize Western society and, and destroy capitalism are, are helpful in creating an anarcho-capitalist 
society. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't even think that if people really wanted to destroy capitalism, like I don't really think that could even happen because you know you always have black markets, right? Whenever you have you know systems of oppression and domination, laws and you know things like that, there's always going to be people who are going to be trading, you know, um, voluntarily but you know illegally all right, under the current regime. You know, I, I, there's just no way you can stamp that out, right? <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, example of this was in the Soviet system. Basically, they, you know, there were so few tradesmen that even, yeah, sure, you didn't have to pay them to come to your house, but they wouldn't even walk in the door unless you, you know, prepared them a, a lavish meal. Mm. So, you no, know, that's right. You're right about that. There will always be trading in markets. But the thing is, after the Spanish, the, these these communists, these whatever, author, I call them authoritarian collectivists, they will try their damnedest. Uh, an example of this is when some quote-unquote anarchists, anarcho-communists or syndicalists, whichever variety they were, took over a geographical area in Spain during the Spanish Civil War in the early 20th century. They killed thousands. They killed like something like 5,000 people. And some of them weren't even, just for having the wrong political ideology, and they Here's the thing. They banned the use of money by pain of death. Hmm. So, like I said, the far left is incredibly authoritarian, and it doesn't have any place within libertarian thought. And I just it frustrates me because I see this ideology really g- gaining ground in well, all over, but a lot in Canada. Yeah, and it's, and it's amazing how, you know, when you think back, when I think back to my, my government schooling, you know, the biggest you know, symbol of evil was Hitler, right? And the Holocaust, right? He killed, you know, 6 million Jews and maybe like, you know, in total 10 million people died under him. Whereas what happened with, uh, you know, Stalin and Mao, you know, you you didn't really hear much about them. (laughs) Because they were allies, but they, yeah, yeah, I think something like 80 million were killed under the the communist Chinese regime. But the interesting thing about Hitler, you know, the Nazis, they were national socialists. There, I, I've seen some quotes posted recently from Hitler proving that he was a socialist. He's like, how could you not be? He, like, he's against, basically, I can't remember the exact quote, but he said something to the effect of, you know, you know he was against the accumulation of capital, and that's why he was against Jews. And this quote I do remember, and it was translated from German, so I don't know if the quote, ta- the the translation is perfect but basically it said um i don't see how one can one can be a socialist and not be anti-semitic so he was he was a proud socialist it's it's funny that the the far left tries to distance themselves from him right now but there's not as far as i'm concerned there's a very there's not a damn lick of difference between communism and socialism it's it's there's some superficial differences yes the the government there's there's uh, some monolithic corporations under fascism who have who ha- who own the factories instead of the government owning them outright? But that's a very small distinction when you see the fact that these corporations and government work hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. You know, when you bring up <laughs> when you bring up what happened in China, you know, in Red China and, and Soviet Russia, uh, that's not what people understand is you know in history like a lot of people probably call themselves communists you know they're, we're doing it for the community right <laughs> well, see they, they don't use it they don't use the term communist anymore because if you use the term communist they'll, they'll just they'll say you're red baiting but the fact is these people do believe in uh, authoritarian ideologies they're either marxist leninists stalinists yeah they uh they're anarcho-communists and comms or you know anarcho-syndicalists which is basically the same thing i think there's a few minute differences between and com anarcho communists and anarcho syndicalists, but basically they want the same thing. No, um, the, these ideas, these ideologies, these far left wing ideologies, they're collectivist and they're authoritarian in nature. Yeah, that's that's all you need to know. You know, it's like uh, you know, there's, there's just two ways, two basic ways you can you can interact with your with your fellow man is right, just by voluntary means or by coercion or force, right? And and it well, doesn't. The, go ahead. The thing the thing about their ideology is. They think that you – say if I were to hire you to mow my grass or do something for me, if I were to hire you, that would be – I would be exploiting their, your labor because I'm not giving you the full, the full benefit of it, right? If I, if, if I sell – if you make widgets for me 
and I pay you $10 an hour, but from making those widgets, I sell what you make for like $50 per every hour you make it, right? They say that's exploitation. You should be getting the full benefit of your labor. But the thing is they don't recognize the risk that the capitalist puts uh, has by, you know, investing his money. He could lose the capital who invests everything could who invests the money could lose everything. Also, they don't they don't understand the deference of gratification and un- under consumption that one must do to create capital. You know, if I'm working and the only way I can uh, keep my money is the only way I can save money is if I under consume what I'm capable of. So I have to under consume. I have to be disciplined under consume so I can save up this nest egg so I can invest it and maybe make more money from it. Right? It, it caught it. To be a capitalist, to be a business owner, it requires discipline and it requires self, uh, no, excuse me, deferral of gratification. Now, I, I don't, from what I know of most ANCOMs, these are not uh, traits they are very familiar with. <laughs> deferral of gratification. Yeah, I like that. I don't, I don't often use that phrase, but yeah, yeah, it's quite right. That's, uh, you know, you got finite, finite resources, right? And, um, and, and infinite desires, right? Um, and so, you know, in, in that sort of society, you know, we need to have a system. You know, people say that capitalism, what, what do they say? Capitalism is based on, you know, infinite, um, never-ending consumption, something like that, and in a finite yeah. world, time, right? The, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Infinite can, if infinite consumption in, an, in a finite world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, right. But, uh, you, know, I, you know, capitalism, the way I describe capitalism to people is like, you know, I have, you know, $5 and you have a sandwich and we trade. I want your, the sandwich more than my $5. You want my $5 more than the sandwich. And is there a victim, right, in that situation? Has anyone lost, right? Has anyone suffered? <laughs> and, but I would, the way I describe capitalism is it is the voluntary exchange between goods and services between two consenting individuals use, usually using an agreed-upon medium of exchange. Yeah, it's always win-win, right? Capitalism is always win-win. Um, it's always voluntary, and if there if there is force applied, then it's not true capitalism. So it's basically, to me, the difference between love making and rape. <laughs> Obviously, know? it's corporatism versus uh, corporatism versus or fascism versus versus voluntary interaction. It's, but yeah, I think when you start to get into these these hardcore kind of race baiting ideal race baiting sex baiting. Uh, ideologies, you have a problem because it it focuses the problem on a specific group. Like you people, you people are privileged. You've got something. You, I'm not doing. I'm not go- doing good because you, you, you. And it makes it really easy for them to basically, you know, justify violence and violence and marginalization of a specific group. Because problems, because I've got problems, because of exploitation. Really, I think these social justice warriors are the moral equivalent to Hitler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of reminds me of uh, Larkin Rose's video. You know, what's the difference between uh, Nazi Germany and the federal government as it stands today? <laughs> and and I, I like to put that, uh, you know, to you know, to challenge uh, uh, some status when, uh, when I talk to them, because what is the difference? <laughs> you know, there, there really is no difference. And, um, you know, every tyrant and dictator and despot that has come to power never came to power on the platform of, I will murder millions of people, <laughs> right? It's always been, I'm the savior. I'm going to lift us out of poverty. We're going to be the, the marvel of the world, you know. Well, it's interesting because you've got all these these people in the they're in the defense just all over the government, but specifically in the United States Department of Homeland Security, uh, Justice Department. They've all gone through these uh, these universities that that promote these 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 agendas. Now, something that your viewers might find interesting: the modern feminist movement. Number one, it wouldn't have happened with they admit a feminist scholar. Miriam Chamberlain actually quoted in, in a report I quote from in my film about how it, basically foundations like the Ford Foundation, specifically the Ford Foundation, but also the Rockefeller Foundation, were instrumental in, in, the, in, in the institutionalization of women or women's studies, which is basically feminist courses, right? Of women's studies. So 
without these authoritarian, without these foundations, these uh, these found these uh, ideologies would not have a foothold in Western society. I also see. I also included a clip from a lecture uh, from a feminist scholar. I think it was from the University of uh, British Columbia. She openly talked about how the first feminists or the first, this, I think these were second wave feminists because the first feminists were just uh, suffragettes who wanted voting, who wanted to vote and own property like their peers, right? They were rich, rich women who didn't, who were mad that they couldn't own property and, and, uh, and vote like their, their brothers and fathers, which is fair enough. But the second wave, this is where feminism and Marxism really became intertwined because after the institutionalization of the, through the big foundations, these feminist scholars start to uh, critique existing Marxist critiques of capitalism, but saying they were insufficient because they didn't have, they didn't include a women's perspective. So what they did is they tweaked and they, they tweaked and they uh, modified and worked within the, these same Marxist theories, critiquing them, right? Tweaking within them. So what we have in feminism today, what modern feminism really is, it's, it's a fusion between uh, it's cultural. It really is cultural Marxism because it's a tweaked version of uh, of Marxist of Marxist theories to paint women as the proletariat. And the the, the in this clip I used in my film, she actually talks about how uh, patriarchy, how the feminists basically found that oh that patriarchy was a blueprint that that, ca that capitalism was a blueprint for exploitation i think the term was that that the ruling class used for uh it was a blueprint for ex exploitation uh that capitalism built upon so they they view and then they, for those who don't know what patriarchy is patriarchy is the is the feminist conspiracy theory that all that all of society is set up <laughs> to disenfranchise women and to build up men. So, yeah, that is the, that is the view of, of these college university professors that are teaching people and indoctrinating students into this ideology. You know, if the damn patriarchy is true, you know, it's doing a terrible job because, you know, what, what like most, what is it, like 80% of the inmates in prisons are male. And, and how many, how many, uh, you know, men are, are being, you know, torn, like, you know, their, their, uh, their very lifeblood is being ripped through their wallets through, you know, alimony and divorce settlements and <laughs> things like that. Well, there's that. that. There's, then, of course, there's, I think, 90% uh, of the victims of assaults and, and not rape, but, Assaults and murders are men, and well, if you, I think rape is ha it's probably half and half if you include the people in jail. Yeah. So it, it's re it probably is more actually, but I'm just being conservative. <laughs> but uh, you no, know, so these I this ideology that is being promoted as feminism is really just a fusion of uh, you know various Marxist critique, various Marxist theories. It's quite insane. And so, you know, when anyone says that they're a feminist, this is the idea they believe. So, so yeah, so according to them, patriarchy and capitalism are twin systems of exploitation with patriarchy being the, the, the first system which capitalism used as a blueprint for exploitation. So these are these are the ideas that are seeping their way into our movement, and people don't it's they don't get it. It's honestly they don't get it because they haven't spent the time trying to understand the these ideologies. But if you look at them, you see that this, it's all poison. What we need is a woman in power as a president. <laughs> that's what's going to solve the that's going to solve our problems, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for the uh, for the conversation. So why don't you let people know where where they can find your work? Oh yeah, my website is libertymachinenews.com. My um, YouTube is Death Metal Patriot, or just find it Richard Heathen. I started when I was more of a like a minarchist type, so I the, the URL is Death Metal Patriot. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's where you can find me on my website and my YouTube. And stay tuned because 
the rise of collectivism is just this close to being out. We just have to do fix a few audio issues, and it'll be out. So I'm hoping to have the DVDs burned within a week. And after that, they'll be available on my website. And uh, I'm hoping everyone will pick one up, support the work I do. Eventually, it'll go on YouTube, but I don't know when. We're also, we'll also be doing digital downloads. I'm probably putting up, put on YouTube in like a month or two. But yeah, right now, just buy the DVDs, get the digital download, support me, help me with my second film, which will be, you know, which will be going into how the social justice movement is working within the environmental movement to um, implement its agenda. Also, another thing, in, another thing I, just a quick, quick uh, fact I kind of wanted to touch on that I never got to. You've got these, you've got these people who are the, the the major environmental activists in the United in, in here in Canada. They're all funded by U.S. foundations and they're all social justice advocates. And you know they're getting they all, there's all these NGOs and uh, far left wing activists working within the government working hand-in-hand hand with the government, a lot of them get American Foundation, millions and millions of dollars. The Rockefeller Foundation, or no, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, along with the Sierra Club, has worked to fund the anti-oil sands campaign to a tune of $7 million a year, and that's just one campaign. Anyways, I'll uh, let you go, and uh, thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. It was good talking to you. Thank you very much. So this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance Network. Uh, wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care.